Excellent. So uh, we, we happy chosen few. Um, we've got a real treat in store this evening because um, this really is one of the highest achievements of um, Western visual uh, and I think um, religious culture. Um, and to be honest with you, you know, you, we would need weeks to really go into any kind of detail um, with this wonderful piece of work. But um, I'm going to, I mean, it, it's, it's very famous. There's huge numbers of documentaries have been done about it. There's lots around on it. So I, I'm not sure if I'll be able to say anything, anything particularly new, but um, I, will, I will give it a go uh, and we'll concentrate on some of the, uh, the lesser known parts of, of the altarpiece as well and, and give you a bit of, of background as to what's going on there. So um, let's begin with uh, the man himself, uh, Jan van Eyck. So he lived during an extraordinary time that we call uh, the Northern Renaissance. Uh, and um, it's almost possible to say that Jan van Eyck was one of the people who kicked off this moment. Um, he was born in 1390, uh, and the, uh, the work that we're going to look at today was done in probably his sort of around his 40th uh, year. Um, this moment sits, uh, the, 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 the beginning of the Northern Renaissance, sits at a crossroads between the medieval age and modernity. And uh, you can see very clearly uh, that Jan van Eyck is the heir to the great medieval Gothic tradition. Um, and you can see that in, in many ways in his paintings, in the architectural uh, kind of motifs that he uses. Uh, and you can see a very clear line back into that medieval um, Gothic tradition. But at the same time, he's beginning to kind of look forward into the humanism which uh, is so fundamental uh, to the Renaissance, both in the north uh, and in the south of Europe, in Italy in particular. Although both of these, these Renaissances both express themselves uh, very differently in terms of art. And uh, I hope I'll be able to say a little bit about maybe why that is. Um, outside of Italy, the Renaissance um, didn't have as direct a link to Greece and Rome. Um, it was based less on rediscovering the uh, pre-Christian classics uh, and uh, con concentrating on Greek and Roman mythology, um, but was more uh, looking at the religious side of uh, of of things and you'll, you, you whereas in Italy uh, immediately the great classics were all translated into Italian um, in the northern Renaissance uh, it was very much a concentrated on um, translating especially scriptural texts and texts that were very strictly related to the faith of, of the people um, what we see in in the artworks of the Northern Renaissance is a focus on colour and detail um, on but not so much on um, uh, on the form especially the human form so think strands of hair but not so much kind of muscle definition or uh, or the the, the, the idealised form that you get a lot of uh, in Italy um, the Northern Renaissance take, uh, is expressed in oil painting on wood, um, whereas in Italy it tends to be expressed uh, more in the kind of fresco. Uh, and there's a much more gradual change from the medieval kind of time, from the medieval era, medieval expressions into a Renaissance, and a, a great focus on the sciences and mathematics um, as opposed to. Uh, um, the more literary philosophical um, bent of the Italian Renaissance. I mean, I'm giving real broad brush strokes here, but I'm just trying to kind of um, show the sort of compare and contrast. And, and Jan van Eyck, who 
uh, we have good reason to think this, uh, this painting is a self-portrait by um, Van Eyck. He is the greatest of these so-called Flemish primitives. Um, there's nothing primitive about them, um, but the, you know, the name stuck after a, an exhibition in the 19th century in Paris of their work. The paintings of the Flemish primitives share some very distinct stylistic characteristics. Um, in 1548, Francisco de Holanda, um, who was a Portuguese um, ambassador um, to Rome, uh, recorded a conversation um, in his uh, book on ancient paintings, De Pinture Antigua, between Vittoria Colonna uh, and the well-known painter Michelangelo, in which they were discussing the art from the north. And Michelangelo expressed his viewpoint on Flemish painting as follows. He says, Flemish painting will, generally speaking, signora, please the devout better than any painting of Italy, which will never cause him to shed a tear, whereas that of Flanders will cause him to shed many, and that not through the vigour and goodness of the painting, but owing to the goodness of the devout person. Michelangelo continues, in Flanders, they paint with a view to external precision or such things as may cheer you and of which you cannot speak ill, as, for example, saints and prophets. They paint objects and masonry and the green grass of the fields, the shadows of trees, the rivers and bridges, which they call landscapes, with many figures on this side and many figures on that. And all this, though it pleases some persons, is done without skillful choice of boldness and finally without substance or vigour. So Michelangelo was not a fan. In fact, Michelangelo is speaking from a very characteristically Italian tendency that everything which is not Italian is perforce inferior. <laughs> something which, despite being Italian myself, I can't agree with, except in the case of maybe religion, food, fashion, music art, <laughs> design, car, a few other, and a few other things. Um, so um, it's interesting to look at the, the kind of the world within which um, Van Eyck was working. So he was born up in, in Flanders in uh, what's now Belgium. Uh, and at that, at that time, it, um, it was controlled by the House of, uh, of Burgundy. Um, so the, the Duchy of Burgundy stretched from down in kind of central France up all the way through Luxembourg and into the Low Countries uh, and uh, all of uh, Belgium. Um, the, the Duke of Burgundy had his, um, had his kind of family uh, home in, um, down, down, in, down in, in the south in, in France. Uh, in a place famous for its, its mustard today, uh, in Dijon. But he didn't have a kind of capital as such. He would move around all his lands and, uh, and make uh, his home in various places. Uh, the court would follow him around, uh, in particular in kind of Bruges um, when he was in Belgium. Um, now, this Philip the Good, um, he really brought the, uh, the Duchy of, of Burgundy to its, its greatest um, kind of territorial... Uh, um, size uh, and its greatest wealth. Um, he, was, he was known as an extremely able administrator uh, and a, a, great, um, a great diplomat, uh, somebody who managed to expand his lands without ever really um, uh, going to war. Uh, he himself married three times, um, finally to a Portuguese princess. And Van Eyck had quite a an important uh, role in the court of um, Philip the Good. Uh, a bit like Holbein, he um, was sent by um, Henry VIII to go and paint uh, uh, prospective uh, wives. Um, Van Eyck was also sent to do the same. Uh, and he went down to Spain and eventually to Portugal and painted a portrait of Isabella, the daughter of the King of Portugal, um, who uh, Philip the Good ended up marrying. Um, she bore three children to Philip, uh, uh, one of whom survived to succeed him. Um, Philip uh, was a very able administrator. He was a bit of a ladies' man as well. Uh, it's thought that he had um, up to 50 illegitimate children. 
um, most of whom became abbots and bishops in his, uh, in his, in his lands. Um, there, there's uh, there's some, some good kind of documentary evidence for how highly uh, Philip thought of Van Eyck um, at one point when they were making some cost cutting exercises within the Duchy of Burgundy, it was suggested that uh, Van Eyck's uh, pension, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the payment that he was being made, um, could be cut. And Philip uh, absolutely refused, saying, no other painter is equal to our taste or as excellent in matters of art and science. Philip's court can only really be described as absolutely extravagant. Um, despite the flourishing uh, bourgeois culture of Burgundy, um, with which the court kept in close touch, he and the aristocrats who formed most of his inner circle retained a worldview dominated by knightly chivalry. Um, and uh, he, him, his knights, his, uh, the, the aristocracy with whom he, he went around really caused um, a, uh, were the kind of leaders uh, of Europe at the time in terms of taste uh, and in terms of um, the material culture that was being produced in his, uh, in his duchy. Uh, and fashion very much was led by, by Philip and his court. Uh, it's in a period from 1444 to 1446, he's estimated to have spent 2% uh, of the entire um, duchy's income uh, with a single Italian supplier of silk and cloth of gold, a guy called Giovanni di Arrigo Arnolfini. Uh, you may uh, recognise the name as we have the Arnolfini uh, portrait in the National Gallery in London. Uh, and uh, the, the very best... Uh, cloth was coming in to the Duchy of uh, Burgundy and the very best was being produced within it and being sold and making huge amounts of money for the cloth merchants of Flanders in particular. Uh, and this is uh, where we come to um, Ghent, which was one of the centres of the cloth trade, Ghent, Bruges, Ypres, those towns were really the centres of the cloth, um, of the cloth merchants. Uh, and there was a whole a uh, class of people making huge amounts of money um, uh, in this trade. Um, a mark of quite how wealthy Flanders had become under Philip's protection is that uh, the painting with, uh, that we're going to speak about today is neither uh, commissioned by a noble nor by the church, but by a man called Jodocus Veit, um, a minor politician in Burgundian terms, um, but uh, somebody who rose to be the mayor of Ghent. So uh, not one of the first cities of, of the Duchy of Burgundy, but an important city nonetheless. Now, why such an unremarkable Ghent politician ended up commissioning the largest and most complex set of panel paintings executed in the 15th century um, is, is an interesting question. Um, some believe uh, this was, uh, you know, the kind of rising middle class uh, in, uh, during this period. Some consider that he suffered from a deep social insecurity despite his considerable wealth. Uh, and uh, firstly, he suffered the shame of his father's disgrace at being found guilty of a financial fraud. Secondly, his political career was rather unremarkable. And finally, he and his wife were childless and he chose to secure his family's legacy with a grand altarpiece intended for his specially commissioned um, Vite Chapel in the parish church of St John. So this was uh, an altarpiece commissioned for a chapel in a parish church in Ghent uh, that was being renewed. So uh, the Gothic church was being built on top of the, the, the previous Romanesque church. It wasn't even the cathedral in Ghent, it was a parish church of the, of, um, the two St Johns. Uh, and in, in terms of securing his legacy, he certainly managed that. It's, uh, we have documentary evidence that um, says that by the end of the 15th century, so 50, 60 years after the, the, uh, the, the Ghent altarpiece had been um, completed, uh, there were already visitors paying to have it opened uh, and great artists, coming to, uh, great artists like uh, Dürer, for example, coming to um, make copies and, and draw... Uh, um, in, in front of the, the painting. 
but the altarpiece itself presents a number of kind of mysteries and conundrums. So the first is to do with its authorship. Um, at the bottom of the frame here, under these four panels, uh, are in its kind of closed state, there's a quatrain, so a four-line poem, written in this very beautiful, very ornate uh, um, Germanic uh, script. Uh, and the, the four lines of the poem say something quite interesting. So it begins, the painter Hubert van Eyck, so you can see there, Hubertus um, van Eyck, uh, than whom none was greater, began this work. So according to the painting itself, um, it's, it's van Eyck's brother, Hubert, who began the work. Then it says Jan, his brother, uh, second in art, completed it at the request of um, Jodokus Wiet. And then at the bottom it says, um, uh, and it was finished on the 6th of May, 1432. And I'll explain how we get to the date in a minute. And he begs you by means of this verse to take care of what came into being. Uh, as with many things in this wonderful um, painting, there's a little bit of a, uh, a very complex and rather sophisticated kind of play on words here at the bottom. You'll see that some of the letters uh, are in red. Uh, and what's happened, if you take all those letters uh, and you pull them out and you add them up, um, you reach the, the figure 1,432, which is the date on which the painting was, uh, was completed. So, um, so we know from uh, this inscription uh, that the, the work was begun by Hubert. It was ended by Jan uh, at the request of use. Uh, and it was all finished on the 6th of May, 1432. Uh, the, this is the most complex kind of polyptic. So, you know, we will know so triptychs with the, uh, we, we've seen there's many triptychs around. Polyptic has uh, multiple uh, panels. Um, there are, in fact, uh, 20 painted panels uh, in the uh, Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. It's a huge... I, how many of you have, have seen this in the flesh? Yeah, it's, it's a very large piece of work. It's three and a half um, metres uh, wide by four and a half metres high. So um, very large. 20 panels are oil on oak um, with some other materials as well, um, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, so the first... and and the thing is, we know absolutely nothing about Hubert van Eyck. In fact, for a long time, it was thought that Hubert van Eyck didn't really kind of exist. And maybe that quatrain was something that had been added later. Uh, although a, um, a, a tombstone was found um, with Hubert van Eyck's name on it, which um, uh, fitted the, the, the right dates and some documentary evidence for some work that he'd done for another monastery in, uh, near Ghent um, also turned up. So we know that Hubert van Eyck definitely existed. Um, and the argument, you know, people have been trying to spot the hand of Hubert van Eyck somewhere in the painting, uh, you know, ever since, ever since the name surfaced, uh, or rather ever since, um, you know, we, we've been able to look at things like that. Um, but it's been very difficult to um, really uh, see anything. We have nothing to compare his work with. We don't, we don't, there are no other surviving works of Hubert van Eyck. Uh, one uh, quite um, plausible theory is that, in fact, Hubert van Eyck, rather than being a, a painter, um, perhaps was a sculptor or, or um, uh, who, who did his work in wood, and he was, in fact, responsible for the frame um, for the, the polyptic itself, and then it was, uh, in fact, Jan who did all the painting. Uh, because you really can't see um, more than uh, one hand at work on um, the polyptic itself. So um, that's the first kind of conundrum that the painting, uh, that, that the, the painting uh, presents us. The second um, is exacerbated by the incredibly troubled story of what can confidently be termed the most stolen painting in history. Um, just to give you a bit of a kind of historical background, 
Um, so the painting is unveiled in 1432. In 1566, it's hidden um, during a Protestant revolt, hidden from the, um, the, the iconoclasts who were looking around for, for uh, paintings to, uh, uh, for, for images to destroy. Um, it, then it, it lives a, a, a relatively calm period until 1794 when the revolutionary soldiers from France take the central panels um, to Paris. Uh, in 1815, after the Battle of Waterloo, the central panels are returned. Uh, and then um, in 1816, the Diocese of Ghent gets into some financial difficulties and the, um, the side panels are pawned. Uh, for I think it was 250 pounds uh, and the, the diocese doesn't manage to buy them back and the pawn shop ends up selling them um, to the Emperor of Prussia um, and they uh, so the side panels end up in Prussia uh, the remaining panels are saved from a fire in 1822 the Adam and Eve panels are sold to the Belgian Royal Gallery of Art again to help the, the diocese pay off some of its debts uh, then during the First World War, the central panels are hidden. Uh, and in 1920, for various reasons, uh, once Germany loses the First World War, the, the panels come back from Prussia uh, and are taken as uh, part of the, of the war reparations. Um, in 1934, there's the theft of um, uh, one of the panels, um, this panel here uh, and its corresponding other side, uh, the, the St. John the Baptist and the Just Judges. Um, the St. John the Baptist is returned as a gesture of goodwill from the thief. Uh, the other panel is never actually found. The, it, never, it never gets returned. And um, currently we have a, a, a copy that was made in the 1930s. Um, uh, and you know, it's one of those things that everybody hopes will turn up one day. Uh, the panel of the Just Judges. Uh, during the Second World War, um, the, the uh, diocese um, can see uh, that things are not going well vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Germans and decides to send the painting in its entirety to the Vatican for safekeeping. Uh, as, it gets, as it makes its way through Vichy, France, it gets stopped there um, and uh, ends up falling into the hands of the Nazis who take it um, to Bavaria, uh, to um, a castle. And then, I don't know if you've all seen that film, The Museum Men. Um, uh, it ends up in a, in a castle which uh, is, is uh, partially bombed and then moved to a, a salt mine for the rest of the war uh, and found by American soldiers at the, at the end of the war and then put back together again. So uh, it has an incredibly uh, kind of colourful history uh, and I'm going to save the surprise of the open altarpiece um, for a bit later and begin by looking carefully at what would have been visible most of the time in the Viet Chapel in uh, St. Barvo's Cathedral in Ghent. So the closed panels are painted in a very restrained palette and the closed altarpiece is like a kind of hint, a taster of the marvels yet to come. So we begin at the top um, in the most kind of remote past with those foreshadowings of the great history of salvation that is about to unfold in front of us from the very ancient prophets uh, to the incarnation uh, below to the very real commissioners of the paintings and opening out into the heavenly realities of which we have a foretaste in every celebration of the sacrifice of the mass. So at the top in the, the kind of upper register, we have the Sibyls, the Prophets, uh, and the Annunciation. Uh, we, I've spoken a, a, a couple of times, I think, in, in some of the talks that I've given about the Sibyls, and we could go into a little bit more kind of detail. These are the two figures of the Sibyls that appear uh, in, in the painting, uh, and they're two Sibyls in particular. I mean, the Sibyls appear, um, if, if you're, if you're uh, uh, familiar with the... Uh, the old rite um, funeral mass, or if you've sung or listened to a requiem, the Dies Irae uh, in the first stanza um, speaks about the Sibyls. Dies Irae, Dies Illa, Solvet Seclum Infabila, Teste David Cum Sibila. Okay, so it's day of wrath and doom impending, David's word 
with Sibyls blending, heaven and earth in ashes ending. So uh, it was very, um, you know, it belonged to the liturgy of the church to say that there were both, uh, that, that the, the, the coming uh, um, of Christ, uh, the, the last things were already foreshadowed, not only by David and by the prophets, but by the pagan Sibyls, um, by the prophetesses uh, of the pagan world. <clears throat> so on the left we see the Erythraean Sibyl. So these, these Sibylline prophecies, so what would happen in the ancient world is if you had a very difficult question, should I go to war, should I marry this particular person, should, you know, what should we do with our country, you know, where should we, how should we defend our city, you would go to one of these places of prophecy, you'd put the question, and then you'd get an answer from the Sibyl, um, a woman, uh, who would be under the influence of the deity, uh, whichever deity it happens to be, like Apollo at Delphi, other, other deities in other places, uh, and they would give you an answer. Uh, the answers are always uh, mis rather mysterious, um, but these answers were always were collected, written down, and then the Romans, who also kind of believed very, uh, uh, gave a lot of respect to these Sibylline prophecies, collected all the Sibylline prophecies, there were about 10 Sibylline, uh, um, s places of prophecy around the ancient world uh, and in the the temple of uh, Jupiter in in Rome uh, there were books that collected together all the different prophecies now um, the Erythraean Sibyl uh, and the Cumaean Sibyl were the two that were most uh, kind of given the most respect by the Romans themselves uh, Erythrae is near Chios on the coast of Asia Minor and um, the Erythraean Sibyl uh, we can attribute to her the invention of the acrostic. Um, all the answers that she gave were in the form of poems uh, where the first letter of each uh, line would spell a word which was key to understanding that particular answer. Um, now, St. Augustine in uh, The City of God, book 18, talks about the Erythraean Sibyl uh, and um, how she... Uh, gave a prophecy which very clearly spoke about Jesus Christ and in fact this long poem um, you know the acrostic actually spells out Jesus Christ um, uh, son of God and saviour uh, this is just like the first stanza so you see the Greek the Greek letters um, that make up the word Jesus so the Erythraean Sibyl is there uh, uh, with a place of honour together with her is the Cumaean Sibyl uh, Cumae is just um, south of Rome near, near Naples and the Cumaean Sibyl uh, we have in one of Virgil's poems Eclogue number four part of her her prophecy now is come the last age of Cumaean song the great line of the centuries begins anew now the virgin returns the reign of Saturn returns now a new de generation descends from heaven on high only you pure Lucina um, smile on the birth of the child under whom the iron brood shall at last cease and a golden race spring up throughout the world your own Apollo now is king so this um, had been interpreted as uh, Virgil was presenting it as a as a, uh, a prophecy about the Emperor Augustus um, but um, the Christian world very quickly adopted this uh, this um, um, this prophecy and applied it to Jesus Christ for, for obvious reasons as you can see so we begin at the kind of in the the mists uh, of of time with these uh, the Sibyls you see here the Erythraean Sibyl out from Turkey in a very kind of uh, oriental uh, dress uh, the Cumaean Sibyl a bit closer to home down in Naples dressed in something a little more familiar and they make a pair together with two of the Old Testament prophets so um, remember these are sitting on top of the the uh, the scene of the annunciation uh, and on the left um, above the angel uh, the angel gabriel we have uh, the prophet zechariah and on the inscription above him um, we can see uh, a uh, a quotation from uh, book nine um, where he says exalta satis filia sion jubila filia jerusalem eke rex tuus veniet so rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Uh, and in fact, um, all the writing on, uh, on the book itself is, is legible. Um, you know, it just goes to show 
the incredible detail and incredible kind of miniaturism that was taking place um, uh, and and you know you can already start seeing the 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 the, the cloth is just incredibly kind of beautifully rendered uh, on the other side above um above Mary and looking directly down at her uh, we see a prophet Micah uh, and um, uh, uh, on the inscription above him it says but you Bethlehem Ephrathah um, you shall be uh, th though you are little among the thousands of Judah yet out of thee shall come unto me that is to be the ruler in Israel so um, so really uh, we see uh, the 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 prophecies looking forward to the Annunciation, looking forward to that moment of the Incarnation. Uh, and underneath uh, these, the prophets and the sibyls, we have this wonderful, um, very brave uh, composition with those two panels in the centre, which seem kind of absolutely empty, but in fact um, are saying all, all sorts of, of things about this, uh, this scene. Um, we have the angel Gabriel holding the, the customary lily, a sign of uh, Mary's um, of Mary's uh, purity and of her, her virginity, uh, and he speaks to her across a room which could have been uh, any room of a, of a kind of palatial dwelling in the centre of Ghent. Uh, it's a wonderfully domestic kind of Flemish context. Uh, outside um, outside this this window here, uh, you can see the typical houses of Ghent. Uh, which if you go there today you'll see them um, looking pretty much exactly like that uh, uh, and in in the second panel we see this kind of alcove uh, which contains uh, um, a basin for washing uh, and uh, sorry and a, a white cloth uh, the water and the white cloth again symbols of Mary's purity and her virginity uh, and the angel speaks to Mary uh, he, he announces to her uh, the, he asks her the, the great question, and uh, and Mary responds, uh, "Ecce Ancilla Domini," uh, and the writing is is placed upside down, uh, perhaps for the Holy Spirit to kind of uh, read uh, from his position above, or or for God um, to see. Again, um, we see some more of this incredible detail, uh, um, incredible miniaturism. You see on on this window sill here, uh, there's a bottle. Uh, a little flagon of water, of uh, pure water through which the the, the light uh, casts its 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 reflection. Uh, again, a symbol of of her purity, of the fact that she allows the light of of Christ to shine through her. Um, so a wonderful uh, a wonderful annunciation. Um, interesting to see. I mean, what what Michelangelo was. You know, he was kind of being rude about the. The, the Flemish um, uh, primitives, but he's not wrong in a sense that they they have this preoccupation with with the kind of surfaces, uh, and you see this very clearly in in the cloth, which doesn't actually give you a huge amount of information about what's kind of going on underneath it. Yeah, um, the cloth is uh, seems to have a real life of its own, um, and I think that's uh, I think that partially it, it's I would say it's probably because in Ghent. Uh, and uh, Bruges and these areas, well, cloth was really where it was all happening. Uh, everything was based, everything was bought and paid for with this wonderful cloth that was being traded and produced around there. Um, but also um, the interest was in these wonderful, uh, the, these wonderful kind of surface details. Uh, underneath uh, the Annunciation, so we go from the distant past to that kind of key moment of the incarnation uh, and then all of a sudden we're there uh, in the present uh, together with uh, Jodocus here on the left uh, and his wife Lisbeth here on the right so these are the two uh, the two commissioners of the painting in a very traditional stance uh, there in prayer uh, and they're they are praying in front of two statues um, painted in this uh, grisaille technique so a black and white technique that's used too often to represent um, statuary or to represent um, uh, you know, architectural uh, context within the paintings. Um, why was this done? Well, partly it was done to show the painter's kind of virtuosity at rendering uh, stone in, um, in paint. 
Uh, secondly, paint was uh, much cheaper than producing uh, a, a, a stone or a marble um, uh, a marble statue. And I mean, this is particularly true up in the north, uh, whereas in, in Italy, um, the, the Renaissance artists of, of the Italian Renaissance had huge amounts of marble at their disposal. Uh, this just doesn't really exist in the north of Europe. And in fact, you see that a lot of most of the statuary at this period uh, and, and going later on um, in the north is produced in wood rather than in, in marble. So there's a couple of reasons why one would be there painting uh, marble statues. Um, so uh, in the, in the centre we see the two St John's uh, to whom the church is dedicated uh, and Judocus as a, uh, as a kind of rather lowly uh, politician doesn't seem to have his kind of family saints um, but is adopting rather the saints of his parish church and we see here uh, St John the Baptist in his kind of traditional pose um, pointing out uh, the, the Lamb of God uh, and giving us a kind of inkling of what we're about to see when the, when the, uh, the, the, the doors of the, of the panel painting are opened. And then on the right hand side we see um, St John the Evangelist, author of the Apocalypse, uh, also very uh, relevant um, because he is our kind of guide to heaven. Uh, he's the one who, who writes in the Apocalypse what heaven will be like. Uh, and he is about, he's the one who describes the heavenly realm that we're about to see. Uh, he's shown holding a chalice full of adders, uh, full of poisonous adders. Sorry. Um, uh, and, uh, and this comes from a, an ancient um, uh, legend that he, he uh, drank poison and uh, uh, survived. <coughs> so you'll notice um, in all of these paintings... Uh, that the light is always coming from the top right, yeah, casting the shadows into the bottom left. Uh, you see that in, in, in all of these paintings. And this is very important because um, you see how Jan van Eyck manages to uh, also take account of the, w the chapel in which this uh, altarpiece is going to be situated. So the chapel is on the sort of south side of the Cathedral of St. Barbo. So all the, the, all the windows are on the right hand side. And so the, the light is, is coming in, the natural light of the chapel is coming in from the, the top right. And this is reflected in, in incredible detail uh, also on the inside of the, of the polyptic. And we'll have a look at that uh, as we go along. So um so just to give you an idea of the kind of effect that this um this altarpiece has uh once it's opened and uh, there's an almost kind of uh wizard of oz type uh um uh kind of re reflection where you have you know the black and white of of Kansas uh, and then all of a sudden you go into the kind of full technicolor uh, of uh, of the heavenly realm um, and um, you know m many many say that the um, it was probably only opened on feast days uh, only opened when the chapel was being used when mass was being celebrated uh, the rest of the time uh, we had to make do with the still rather fantastic paintings on the outside. Now, what, so what do we see when we open up? Um, so really what, what this whole polyptic is doing is it's giving us this overview of the history of salvation um, from uh, really from the beginning to the end, from Adam and Eve uh, all the way through um, to the, uh, the incarnation, uh, to those uh, from, from those uh, prophecies of old to the incarnation, to the present moment um, in which Jodocus and Lisbeth were, were alive and through into the future, uh, into the destiny that awaits us all, uh, hopefully, uh, in the, uh, the beatific vision in heaven. Um, but even in the opening, in, in that showing us of heaven, uh, Van Eyck manages to keep that very... Um, uh, that, that sense of drama 
uh, of the fact that um, this is a story uh, that goes from, from sin and death towards uh, salvation. Uh, that it's a story that where we come from sin and death and we go towards glory. Uh, and that we do this, especially during the Mass. Um, these two figures of Adam and Eve on, on, the either, si on either side are in incredible kind of, uh, they, they in, in tension with the rest of the painting. Uh, they, they don't have these kind of wonderful lavish clothing, uh, but they are very stark in their nakedness. Uh, and I think, you know, you can really appreciate the Van Eyck gives us a panorama of salvation history, beginning with this extraordinary depiction of Adam, the man, rendered in almost, I would say, kind of heartbreaking detail. And um, this is the man after the fall, naked, ashamed, afraid, uh, every hair Every wrinkle, every vein and muscle is that of a man who needs to be saved. Um, his face and his hands are browned by the sun. Um, you'll see that, look, his hands are a, a, a darker and his face are a darker colour. This is a man who's had to work, who, who after, after the fall has had to begin to work for his food. Uh, he's not the idealised kind of pre-lapsarian Adam of Michelangelo but one who belongs very much to our world. Uh, he and Eve are the only figures without the blue sky of heaven behind them, uh, as you'll see, but he strides out into our world to join us in awaiting the fulfillment of God's promise as we share in his toil and the consequences of his sin, and we add our own to the mix as well. Um, but together with him, we wait in hope for that coming of that glory that we see in the, in the center of the painting. Similarly, Eve is shown in unflinching detail. Um, she holds, interestingly, this is a, a fruit called an etrog or a citron. Uh, it's, uh, it's like a kind of lemon uh, with a very thick uh, skin, uh, very bitter um, and very sour, uh, symbolizing perhaps the bitterness of the fall of, of what happens to man once, uh, once he sins. And, and above um, Adam and Eve uh, are uh, two little kind of lunettes in that grisaille um, in which we see their children, um, uh, Cain and Abel. So above Adam, the, the, uh, Adam, the kind of the worker in the fields, we see Cain and Abel giving the produce of that work uh, to, to, uh, to God. Uh, and uh, Cain is there um, having his, his, his uh, offering rejected. And the next scene we see the great um, uh, consequence of the sin, of violence that comes into the world. Uh, at this point in the Bible, we don't have any evidence of, of uh, tool making or anything like that. So he's, he's killing his brother with the, uh, with the jawbone of, a, of an animal. So at, above Adam and Eve are depicted the consequence of the fall, which pale into black and white before the riotously colourful triumph of God's mercy. So if we move to the central panels um, in, inside, we see uh, this very, um, we see, a, I mean, it's an incredible kind of image, um, really, you know, just absolutely uh, astounding in its, in its colour, in its detail, in its... Um, in its kind of majesty, you know, everything about it speaks of, of real wonder and beauty. Um, and it's, and yet it's, it's, a very an, it's a, an image which has a very ancient heritage in Christian art. And it's known as the deesis uh, or supplication. And it's a, it's, a, uh, a, it's a composition which you see very often in, uh, in, um, in, Eastern iconography and in, in Eastern uh, right churches you'll see often it's above the above the door that goes into the, onto the sanctuary uh, you have this the deesis uh, and also always in the deesis you have uh, Christ in the center um, shown as Pantocrator or Almighty seated on a throne with a gesture of blessing flanked uh, by his mother uh, on on the left and John the Baptist on the right making this gesture of supplication um, it's unheard of in uh, Eastern iconography to depict God the Father, uh, except as a, as a hand kind of poking out of the sky. Uh, we've, uh, we've spoken about this, I think, in, in the, the, 
the, uh, the lecture on, on the, the Holy Spirit in art. Um, but you see, this is uh, a, a kind of continuation of this very ancient um, depiction of this very ancient um, uh, composition. Because there's always been a, qu a question as to who exactly is being, um, is being uh, represented there in the center. It's a rather kind of mysterious figure. If you, if you look at it, it doesn't look like any Christ really that, that, you, that we're familiar with. Um, he's, uh, he's wearing the papal tiara, which um, has often been associated with depictions, at least in, in the West, of God the Father. Uh, he has no wounds on his hands. Uh, he wears shoes, which is also quite unusual for Christ um, because he shows his wounds in his hands and his feet. Uh, and he's dressed in this sumptuous robe. Uh, he holds a rock crystal scepter, um, which is a, a marvel of, uh, of kind of transparency rendered in paint. Uh, and he oversees the whole kind of story of salvation um, below him. Um, the, the painting of the, the, um, of the tiara, of the, I mean, of, of the robe in particular, is really incredible. I mean, you go into, you can see, you know, the stitching is rendered here. Uh, and the, the, um, the pearls which decorate this incredible um, cope that he's wearing uh, all, every single one of them, it has this highlight um, of, of light shining from the top right uh, from that place where, where the window itself in the, in the chapel would be. But, um, and, you know, it says here, it, it used the word Sabaoth, God Sabaoth. Um, but the arguments in favour of it being Christ rather than God, I think, are quite convincing. And in particular, if we look uh, at the, the background, the, the kind of brocade uh, background um, behind him, we see uh, very clearly um, some of the uh, symbolism that often accompanies Christ. Uh, we have this monogram here, Jesus uh, Rex, so Christ the King. And underneath it, uh, we have the pelican. Uh, the pelican, which is always a symbol of Jesus Christ, because uh, mistakenly it turns out, but um, there was a belief that the pelican uh, would feed its children by pecking its own breast uh, and uh, letting the blood flow and giving its own blood to its its uh, um, its chicks uh, in order to uh, to allow them to survive. And this was a, a, a considered to be a great. Um, image of Jesus Christ who gives us his own blood to drink. See the three little chicks there. And this is kind of repeated, uh, this pattern is repeated and, and surrounded by grapes. Um, uh, and so there's, you know, this Eucharistic Christological imagery is uh, very clearly there and I think points us to think, um, seeing that this figure is in fact um, Christ rather than God the Father. Um, I was talking about that the, the panels were painted, but uh, it has been discovered that, in fact, these, all of these par parts are what was called kind of pressed brocade. So uh, silver um, foil uh, was beaten into the shape, um, into the, these shapes, and then painted over and then applied uh, to the, the wooden panel. Uh, really, uh, and it really gives a kind of 3D effect, which is, which is quite um, wonderful. Um, on either side of the diocese of Our Lady of uh, John the Baptist and, and of um, Christ the King, uh, we have uh, a, a fabulously bejeweled and brocaded uh, copes uh, stand on some of the, the most famous musicians in art history. Uh, on the left, we have the angels. Uh, they don't actually have wings, but they've always been considered to be angels singing the praises of God for all eternity. Um, they stand in front of a large lectern with a, 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 a big book of, um, you can just see a couple of little notes here, um, a big book of uh, certainly it would be the, the kind of polyphony that was being written in the court of um, <laughs> Philip the Good. Um, the figures uh, uh, all have, uh, all these singers, they all have different expressions on their face. Each one is like very pointedly different to the other. And this is thought to be a uh, kind of way, a visual way of representing the different notes they were all singing, um, the, the, uh, the polyphony of the time, you know, so 
can imagine if, if they'd been singing Gregorian chant, they would all looked they would have all looked very similar. Uh, but since they're singing uh, polyphony, they all have a slightly different look on their face. Uh, on the other side, oh, and really one thing that you see here, so the clasp of the cope of this, this sort of front singer has um, an incredible uh, piece of detail where uh, instead of having the, the little highlight that you have on all the poles, because of its shape, it actually manages to, um, he actually manages to paint the, uh, a reflection of the window uh, of the chapel. Uh, and if you go into the chapel today, you see uh, these long, thin windows um, of, of this chapel, a really in incredible piece of, of uh, realism as, as well as, as detail. Uh, on the other side, uh, we have another set of musicians, this time instrumental musicians. Um, we think that this may well be St. Cecilia at the organ. Uh, I suppose if you're in heaven, you want the very best playing the music. And so you have the patron saint of musicians, St. Cecilia, sitting in this wonderful uh, brocaded um, uh, and ermine-lined um, uh, you know, uh, cloak uh, sitting in front of this absolutely kind of piece of bravura painting um the virtuoso um kind of jewelry that we saw the the virtuosity is transferred this time to the the representation of the of the metal work uh, on the organ which is really absolutely kind of extraordinary uh, and then we move um down to the central panel um which is in incredibly different in 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 its kind of scale in the scale of the figures uh, uh, to the, the upper register where every, you know, all the figures are full height taking up the entire space. We move down to the central panel where everything converges uh, on the Lamb of God at the centre. The scale changes and heaven now is shown uh, in a wealth of mind-boggling detail. Nature takes on a kind of hyper-reality um, you know, where we, we see here in a glass darkly, but when we go to heaven, we'll see everything as it really is. And um, really, Jan van Eyck begins here to kind of show the full extent of what he can do. Uh, in um, and we see in the bottom left, we, we have uh, the prophets. So we have 12 prophets here in the front, and we have the four most important prophets. Uh, we think here, uh, Isaiah etc and the 12 minor prophets behind them are people of every kind uh you know you can see the kind of wonderful uh, variety of hats and uh you know some have kind of uh, hebrew lettering on the hats and, uh, and we see even some kind of pagans with this is thought to be virgil um holding uh, with a with a laurel wreath around his his head uh, so this is the prophets of israel uh, and the people of every tongue, tribe, and nation who come towards Christ, uh, all, all coming to, to worship uh, the Lamb. <clears throat> On the right-hand side, kind of mirroring the prophets, uh, we have the, uh, the 12 apostles here in the front. Uh, and behind them are the members of the church who have died giving witness um, to, to Christ. We have the, the, the martyrs. Uh, led, uh, as, is, as is right, by the, by the popes, uh, behind them by the bishops. Uh, then uh, we have the uh, deacon, we have uh, uh, Stephen here with the stones uh, in his, with which he was killed uh, in, his, in his Dalmatic. Uh, and behind them we have kind of monks with their kind of tonsure. And behind them we have all the lay people who gave their life for the faith. Uh, in the top left, we see the confessors, the great saints who didn't die for their faith, but who received the palm of victory, uh, not through martyrdom, but because they confessed the faith. Uh, again, led by, by the Pope, by the cardinals, by the Pope's cardinals, bishops, uh, friars, uh, going on um, through to the laity. On the top right-hand side, we have uh, all the, the female saints um, uh, dressed in sumptuous finery, uh, as befits their glorious state as saints in heaven. Uh, and here again, we have all sorts, you know, led by uh, kind of noble women uh, uh, going through to, to kind of nuns in the background. Was there, was there an abbess? I can't remember. I it was. Um, and then moving out of the kind of central panel, we have again, we have some uh, another couple of groups.
groups who were kind of... Uh, on the left, we have the knights who took up the sword in defense of the faith, and there are a few that we can actually recognize. Uh, one of them is Louis of King Louis of France, who led uh, two, two crusades before he, uh, before he died and was canonized. Uh, we have Charlemagne, uh, Godfrey of Bouillon, uh, and this, this is the panel that, in fact, was stolen uh, and hasn't been recovered yet. So the copy um, that's there uh, does a pretty bad job of, uh, of um, uh, imitating uh, Van Eyck. You see just quite... I mean, the, the, the lack of depth... If you have a look at it, it's incredible, the, the kind of lack of depth in comparison to the panel next to it. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we have uh, the pilgrims... Uh, and the hermits, all those who kind of left behind the riches of the world and uh, dedicated their lives to to the church and to finding uh, God. And here in particular, um, so we see uh, St. Christopher, patron saint of all of pilgrims, who was uh, reputed to be a giant, hence, his, hence he stands head and shoulders above all the rest. And we see uh, these various pilgrims uh, with, uh, with the symbols of of uh, the pilgrimage to Santiago, uh, to Jerusalem. And here, here um, again, Van Eyck gives a real demonstration of his botanical virtuosity as well, by representing the, the, uh, the flora and the fauna of, of the kind of Mediterranean. So we see palm trees, we see uh, cypresses, uh, we see um, yeah, we have a maritime palm as well. So again, uh, here we have a whole different set of plants uh, you know, representing the, the far countries that the pilgrims go to. Wonderful Mediterranean landscape. Uh, and then down at the, at the very bottom of the painting, we have this um, this font, uh, this fountain uh, with the water kind of dancing on the surface. It's really worth. I mean, there's a website where you can see uh, these um, incredibly detailed macro photographs of uh, of painting uh, which were done during the recent restoration and you can see really the water that as as the water kind of trickles uh, down out of these spouts into the water how it kind of dances on top of the uh, on top of the water in in the fountain and then out of the fountain comes the water uh, and then it goes down this gully and um, down towards the altar above which uh, the painting sits uh, and towards priest celebrating Mass and towards us. So here we reach the central theme um, of the communion of the mystical body with its head through the sacrament of the Eucharist and the living water from the fountain symbolically flowing in the direction of the priests, uh, the, 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 the priest celebrating the Eucharist on, at the altar. Um, it's very interesting, I mean, when we think of when we think of these altar pieces and we look at them, we have to think about the way that they work, the way that they kind of work choreographically almost, you could say, with the celebration of the Mass. Uh, and you will often find that there's like, a, there's a, like an empty space in the middle uh, or some, a, a place which is very specifically meant for the elevation of the host, that the host will sit within the, uh, the composition and complete it. As, as the water kind of trickles uh, down out of these spouts into the water, how it kind of dances on top of the, uh, on top of the water in, in the fountain. And then out of the fountain comes the water, uh, and then it goes down this gully, um, down towards the altar above which uh, the painting sits, uh, and towards the priest celebrating the Mass, and towards us. So here we reach the central theme um, of the communion of the mystical body with its head through the sacrament of the Eucharist and the living water from the fountain symbolically flowing in the direction of the priests, uh, uh, the, the, the priests celebrating the Eucharist on, at the altar. Um, it's very interesting. I mean, when we, think of, when we think of these altar pieces and we look at them, we have to think about the way that they work, the way that they kind of work choreographically almost, you could say, with the celebration of the Mass. Uh, and you will often find that there's like, a, there's a, like an empty space in the middle uh, or some, a, a place which is very specifically meant 
for the elevation of the host, that the host will sit within the, uh, the composition uh, and complete it. And this, there's very much, this is very much the space where, where this font um, uh, is, is sitting. And it's interesting that um, having done some uh, uh, x-rays and uh, infrared photography of, of the, the painting, so all of this is the underpainting that would have been used to prepare um, before the, the color went on top. That, in fact, the fountain is completely missing um, from the underpainting. So it seems that perhaps the fountain was a kind of uh, a, a something that was added in later on. Um, and it's, it's rather interesting that the, um, we know from, from the painting that it was, it was unveiled on the 6th of May, 1432. Uh, and uh, looking back at the, at the records, we, uh, we discover that the son of, uh, of Philip the Good and Isabella of Portugal was uh, baptized on the 6th of May, 1432. So there, uh, there are theories that sort of say that this was uh, this, this uh, extra kind of baptismal um, um, emphasis was uh, kind of added in to commemorate this, the great kind of baptism of the heir of the, the Duchy of Burgundy. I don't know how, uh, how, how true that, that, that may be, but it is, it is particularly kind of interesting that that, that um, seems to be missing from the kind of preparatory painting. Um, so although important, the civic um, uh, kind of meaning and the symbolism that was connected to the Vite family uh, is, it is kind of trumped on the inside by the function of the altarpiece uh, in, during the Mass. And a treatise on the Eucharist by a Ghent author uh, completed some uh, 10 years after the painting, revealed that the inscriptions and images of the interior of the Ghent altarpiece all relate coherently and simply to a single theme. Uh, and that theme is that of the communion of the mystical body with its head, and the living water from the fountain flowing towards us as we take part in the Mass. Uh, and reminding us that every time that we we take part in the, in the Mass, every time we, we attend the, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we are participating in a heavenly liturgy, uh, that we, there, we are there not just with those people around us, but together with the angels, with the saints, uh, with, with Christ himself, with our Lady, John the Baptist, uh, looking forward to um, taking part in the, the true heavenly liturgy that we'll, that we'll reach, and that will be our, our destiny forever to take part in that liturgy. So what, what really um, Van Eyck does in a kind of wonderful way is kind of opening out to us uh, the true meaning of the Mass, and the true meaning of uh, the true destiny of our lives, which is to go, to go towards uh, that, that um, beatific vision, praising God all the time, singing his praises, um, praying to him. So um, anyway, I think I've managed uh, just over an hour to take you through the... That was brilliant.